Hi, welcome to Premium Builds. I'm John, and this is our B560 motherboard roundup. The Intel i5 range, particularly CPUs like the i5-11400 and 11400F, offer some of the best value on the market right now. However, to get the most out of these CPUs, you need a B560 motherboard. This chipset now allows RAM overclocking and can get a good amount of performance out of these CPUs. In order to properly inform you as to what we think the best purchases are, we thought we'd buy a selection across the market and test them out to see what kind of features and performance they have. As it turns out here, there's a lot more going on than simply features and looks. For a long time, we've reasonably expected that any given motherboard should allow a CPU that's compatible with it to perform at or near its top level, until you get into overclocking boards and Z series on the Intels. However, with B560, as we ran into these tests, we've actually found some quite important differences in the way they behave, and in the ultimate limits of some of these boards. What's disappointing is that it's possible to choose a motherboard that will actually throttle even an i5-11400 and not allow that CPU to perform at its peak potential. There's a little bit of subtlety to this, it depends on setup in some cases, but please don't buy a B560 motherboard until you've watched this video and understood the differences between them, which you can make perform correctly, and which simply will leave you wanting and won't let you get the most out of a CPU. The boards we've got under test here are the MSI Bazooka, which is an entry-level offering. Then in the mid-range we've got the Asus Tough Gaming Wi-Fi, which is a mid-range board with Wi-Fi integrated. We've also got the Gigabyte Aorus Pro AX, which again has Wi-Fi integrated and is towards the top end of the B560 motherboard market. Representing ITX options, we've got the Asus ROG Strix B560i Gaming, um, which is a nicely featured board, but there's a very limited market, very few boards to choose from in ITX on this uh, chipset. And finally, we've got the ASRock HDV, which we'll talk about probably more than some of the others in this test, because it's the one that shows the most revealing results. And to cut a long story short, it's a board you should absolutely avoid, um, even if you see it discounted. It is a board that will not allow an i5 CPU on the 11th gen to perform to its full potential. We'll take you through the features of these boards, how easy they are to set up and work with, and how they look in BIOS as well, and the BIOS options they make available to you. We'll give you some insights into their performance, because as I've alluded to, some of these don't perform the same. And there are some settings you can change to rectify that with some of them, but not the others. At the end of this, I'll give you my thoughts and recommendations because I've tested boards now across the market and from different manufacturers. I'll use that to give my insights into which boards I think could represent good value and a good purchase option across the range. So sit tight and let's get stuck in and work out what's going on with the B560 motherboards. All of these boards share some basic features common to the B560 platform. All are PCIe 4.0 compatible in the primary M2 and PCIe slot. All have two M2 slots in total. They all allow RAM overclocking. Starting at what is unquestionably the bottom of the stack, the ASRock HDV has just two RAM slots and it's even been cut down from the normal M80X size using just six mounting points instead of the usual eight. It doesn't have any postcode troubleshooting lights or a BIOS flash function. The rear I.O. lacks DisplayPort and instead has both DVI and even a D-sub port along with three audio jacks and just six USB ports. There's gigabit LAN but no Wi-Fi. It has just one full-length PCIe X16 slots and two X1 slots. It lacks a USB 3.2 Gen 1 header, so many more modern cases aren't compatible without an adapter and will lose that connector's potential speed. It has just four SATA ports for additional drives. There's no heat sinking on the M2 drive or on the voltage delivery circuitry, but more on that later. Moving up to the MSI Bazooka, this board has heat sinking on the VRMs and primary M.2 slot and a military-themed aesthetic. We get four RAM slots, but have just one full-length PCIe slot and two additional length slots for Wi-Fi cards or similar. The rear I.O. is pretty sparse, with just six USB ports, three audio jacks, and a 2.5 gigabit Ethernet port. There's HDMI and DisplayPort outputs if you want to use the iGPU. It does have some basic troubleshooting boot LEDs and six SATA ports. There's an AIO pump header and adequate fan headers for most builds. It does lack the USB 3.2 Gen 1 header, so check your case compatibility. There's an RGB header, but no RGB on the board itself. The Asus Tough Gaming B560M Plus Wi-Fi is firmly mid-range and has a good suite of features. Importantly, it has inbuilt Wi-Fi 6, so there's no need for an additional card to get Wi-Fi and boot Bluetooth connectivity. It's got 8 USB ports on the rear, plus a USB-C, 5 audio jack connectors, plus optical out, and 2.5 gigabit LAN as well as DisplayPort and HDMI. The I.O. shield is inbuilt too, making install a cinch. We get two full-length PCIe slots, so a capture card or similar secondary card will fit fine in the lower slot. There's four RAM slots, six SATA slots, and a USB 3.2 Gen 1 header to give you those high-speed ports on the front of the case. It's again got that TUF militarized aesthetic and some neat RGB highlights on the board. 
The Gigabyte Aorus Pro represents the higher end, with a sleek silver aesthetic, heavy aluminium heat sinking, and an integrated I.O. plate. They've managed to cram in 9 USB ports on the rear, and a USB-C socket as well, alongside the Wi-Fi 6 antenna connectors. Internally, there's two full-length PCIe slots, and one awkwardly placed single-length slot, directly below the first PCIe slot, along with six SATA ports, and a USB 3.2 Gen 1 header socket, and a good number of USB 3.0 and audio connectors, as well as RGB control headers. It also has a Q flash button on the bottom edge of the board, useful for BIOS rescue missions. It's worth mentioning the VRMs here. This board has a 12 phase 50 amp setup, which is clearly the best specified in the test. Finally, we come to the mini ITX board on the test, the Asus B560i ROG Strix. This is a premium board, but contends with the constraints imposed by its tiny size. The rear I.O. is integrated and includes six USB sockets, a USB Type-C, Wi-Fi 6 antenna connectors, and five audio jacks. And unusually, it also has an audio Type-C connector. There's 2.5 gigabit Ethernet, a display port, and an HDMI output. Internally, there's two M.2 slots, one front with dual-sided heat sinking, and a rear slot as well. You have to contend with the mini ITX limitations of a single PCIe slot, two RAM slots, four SATA ports, one each of USB 3.0 and 3.2 Gen 1 headers, and limited fan headers. Asus include a handy USB extension cable with this board as well. Let's talk a little bit about the ease of setup and install in terms of their physical design and layout. Full marks here go to Asus for their M.2 clip, which makes drive installation a cinch. The manuals are clear and accurate, and they have integrated backplates. The Gigabyte also has an integrated I.O. plate, but it loses marks for its awkward M.2 installation solution with a split standoff. The heatsink looks like it's hinged, but it's actually just a tab. The awkward process is exacerbated by a manual that doesn't have clear diagrams or even reference the M.2 installation procedure. It's outdated and can do with a refresh to help first-time builders along. It is actually possible to get this M.2 installation wrong, so take a look at my reference image to show how it should be set up. The MSI Bazooka has a separate I.O. backplate, but the M.2 installation is easy enough and the manuals are clear. Post lights help diagnose any installation or settings errors. In clear last place is the Adrock HDV. The I.O. shield is incredibly basic pressed tin. There's no diagnostic lights or BIOS flash button to help troubleshoot. I actually bricked this motherboard during my testing of it, with some settings that were incompatible, and it took a number of attempts to reset the CMOS and get it working again because it was impossible to work out exactly what I'd done. At least with no M.2 heatsink and only two RAM slots, it's hard to get it wrong when you put it together. There's a major problem when it comes to the configuration of this board though, which we'll come to in the performance section. You don't often see critique of motherboard's BIOS in reviews, and I guess that's because for most people it's a one-time setting, you'll simply go into make your initial settings and never see it again unless something goes wrong. B560 is the first non-enthusiast Intel chipset to permit RAM overclocking, so that highlights the need to enter BIOS to set up RAM correctly, and delve through menus and settings that otherwise you may never see. There's another issue here, and that's that some of these boards have default power settings that actually limit performance even of i5 CPUs. That means you might need to dig into power settings to get full performance, and again, if the BIOS isn't intuitive, that can be a tricky task. BIOS is somewhat subjective because your comfort with a particular layout hinges on what you're used to. However, I'm giving this one to MSI for their clearly laid out and well-segmented BIOS menus. On initial setup, it's the only BIOS that clearly explains the need to set your power limits according to the cooler you're using, and shows exactly what the limits will be set to. Once you're in BIOS, there's a basic simple mode which lets you select XMP and boot order, likely the only tasks you'll need to do. Advanced mode opens up a wealth of options including fan tweaking, memory overclocking settings, power limits for the CPU, and saving and applying profiles. Overall I found this the best laid out and friendliest BIOS to use. Asus and Gigabyte suffer from the same slightly confusing layout in advanced mode. Numerous settings are jumbled together and it's not entirely clear what settings relate to. Asus buries submenus making them hard to navigate. It does however default to using multi-core enhancement, which allows the CPU to use higher power limits, but it's not entirely clear to the first time user exactly what this means, and it's very much sold to you as an option you should select. Try as I might, I can find no direct reference to power limits in the Gigabyte BIOS. If they are there, they're well hidden or called something unintuitive. It suffers from the same problems as us, with a slightly confusing BIOS layout, but it's functional and makes an effort to explain some settings like load line calibration, which is nice. The ASRock BIOS is acceptable in layout and function, but again its power settings are both obscured and do not actually allow a full power limit, likely because of the constraints of the board's physical design. As a result, you cannot set a power limit higher than 100 watts, and we'll just demonstrate the effect this has on performance next. Other than that, the ASUS, Gigabyte and ASRock biases are all very similar in layout and function, and serve their purposes well enough. Let's talk a little bit then about the performance of these boards. Firstly, one of the reasons B560 is being recommended is because it permits memory overclocking on non-K CPUs for the first time, and this brings quite significant performance uplift in some cases. 
All of these motherboards allow memory overclocking and all of them have very similar settings available to the user to permit that function. Each one of these boards accepted the XMP profile and 3600MHz CL16G skill RAM that I used for testing without any issues whatsoever and all of them defaulted to gear 1 memory mode in that as well. So they were running the memory clock one to one with the RAM. I didn't have time to push memory overclocks with my faster Samsung B die kit. Um, I know that the performance benefits become relatively limited beyond 3600 MHz, certainly in terms of the cost of that RAM. Where we do start to see some important performance differences in these boards is how they implement the different power level settings for the CPU, especially when you just run them at default without tweaking those settings yourself. To demonstrate, here's a graph showing the Cinebench R23 score of each of these boards running an i5-11500 CPU using their default power settings. Whilst the two Asus boards and the Gigabyte Aorus all turn in similar results at about 10,200, we can see the MSI Bazooka and the ASRock HDV fall significantly behind. What's going on? Logging metrics, we can compare the CPU behaviour through this test. Put simply, this is the impact of power limiting behaviour by the motherboard. The MSI deploys a higher power limit which allows the CPU to draw 110 watts for the first section of the test, running the CPU at its rated 4.2 GHz all core speeds. Then it drops to a 65 watt long term power limit, which limits clock frequencies to 2.5 GHz and causes the low score. The ASRock initially appears to be doing better, but look closely, it's never able to deliver more than 100 watts. It then drops to 65 watts and clocks the CPU to 3.5 GHz to complete the test, again producing a lower score. Meanwhile, the Asus TUF maintains 110 watts for the full duration of the test, running the CPU at 4.2 GHz throughout, and that's down to the multi-core enhancement setting. 110 watts is all the CPU will draw to achieve peak potential. It doesn't need the full 125 watt limit. The Asus B560i ROG Strix and the Gigabyte Aorus Pro both mimic this behaviour in this test, deploying the full power capability of the CPU and allowing it to clock to its peak clocks. You can fix the MSI Bazooka's behaviour by selecting tower or water cooler in the initial setup, which sets higher power limits. However, if you start trying to adjust the power limits in the ASRock HDV BIOS, you can't push it beyond 100 watts. The ASRock HDV, however, cannot be saved. Imposing a 100 watt limit in BIOS improves the CPU performance as can be seen in this retest with power limits removed, but its performance still falls short of the other boards. If you're thinking, hey, that's not too bad, it's only 200 points behind, then I'll urge you to watch the linked video to this in which I explore deeper the issues with power management on B560 motherboards. We've got much more testing, including testing with an i9-11900K, and those tests really do show why this is such a bad result for the ASRock HDV. So in terms of performance, the MSI, Gigabyte, and the two ASUS boards all perform equivalently or can be made to perform equivalently, although you do need to pay a little bit of attention to power limit settings. The ASRock HDV underperforms in this test, throttling an i5-11500, and for that reason it gets a serious black mark against it for performance. It's a board you really should not consider even for an i5 build. In conclusion then, our testing has highlighted some important differences on the B560 platform. It's not just about selecting the features and price point you're willing to pay or looking at the looks of the board, you do actually need to consider performance. The performance issue is really one of Intel's own making. Their dogged adherence to squeezing every last drop out of an aging architecture and process leaves them with mid-range CPUs that need serious amounts of power to perform. These power delivery components aren't cheap and leave manufacturers in the unpleasant position of trying to deliver compatible boards and attractive price point. I can only assume that boards like the ASRock HDV or some of the Gigabyte UD offerings are intended for use with i3 CPUs in office style low demand builds because they're really not suitable for anything more. I've dived into this more in my companion video so please do give that a watch so you can bask in the horror of some of the impacts of cost cutting in motherboard design. Using my testing results and having played with these boards across the range of the market, here are my recommendations for the boards you should look out for. Looking at entry level boards, avoid the bottom of the market across all brands and anything without VRM heatsinks. I have no confidence in their ability to properly power even an entry level i5 CPU. Gigabyte have many variants of the UD range at the entry level, and they all use similar six phase power designs. Most don't have heat sinking, so I'd advise you to avoid those. And without testing the design, I'm reluctant to recommend the ones that have seat heat sinks, because there's potential for it to limit even i5 CPUs. MSI have demonstrated that a lower phase count can work well, but ASRock have shown how it can also go wrong. From my testing, the MSI Bazooka seems like an excellent entry point for B560 motherboards. I have absolutely no hesitation in recommending it if you are on a tight budget, or if you need to cut costs even further, there's the MSI Pro VDH, which is identical in specification and has VRM heat sinks. It just loses the gamer aesthetic. Asus look to have used a fairly robust eight phase VRM design across their affordable prime range. They also have heat sinking. The B560M-A or the B560-Plus look to be good options at the entry level with full featured good looking boards. 
At the mid-range, the MSI Morta and the Asus Tough Gaming both hit a decent sweet spot of solid VRM design and features and both have integrated Wi-Fi 6 options available. You can look at the MSI Torpedo 2 if you want an ATX board with similar specifications to the Morta. Those are my recommended boards in the mid-range. Gigabyte have done a good job of VRM design since the Coffee Lake era and this is no exception. The closely matched Aorus Elite and Aorus Pro are near identical in specification and price. The Pro looks to have slightly stronger components in the VRM but the same basic design. The Aorus Pro is my pick for the strongest VRM on test, it had no problem supplying power to the i9-11900K and its all-round specification matches the other boards on test. It's my pick of the higher range boards. At the upper end, or for an i7-11700, well I'd recommend that if you're pushing towards $200 you should probably look at a Z590 motherboard instead. Whilst the Asus Strix and MSI Tomahawk are good offerings, I'd look to gain the flexibility of a Z590 platform as we approach that price point. You could also consider the platform cost of a switch to the Ryzen Zen 3 CPU and a more cost-effective AMD B550 motherboard, where there's a range of good options for around $100 to $150 that offset the slightly higher CPU cost. There really isn't a lot of sense in trying to get the value out of a CPU like the i5-11400 or the i5-11700, but then overspending on a motherboard to support them. If you're looking for a mini ITX board, then the Asus B560i doesn't disappoint. It allows both the i5-11500 and the i9-11900K to perform to their potential, and it has the same features as any other B560 ITX board on the market. My only misgivings are really about the suitability of the platform as a whole, because a more efficient AMD CPU might be a better choice when it comes to heat management in a mini ITX build. That said, it's a great looking and well specified board, and gets my pick from the handful of MITX B560 offerings. Well, that concludes my roundup. I hope you found it interesting and informative and hopefully it may even have prevented you from making a purchasing mistake in buying what is a cheap motherboard you might reasonably expect to perform well, but unfortunately doesn't. Please make sure you don't buy the ASRock HDV and be very cautious at the cheaper end of the market to ensure you're getting a motherboard that will actually support the CPU you want to fit to it. Please take a look at my companion video to this where I dive a little bit deeper with some more results into the power delivery specification of these boards and how they behave. Please do check out premiumbuilds.com, we've got loads of build guides and reviews on there, component selection choices and other information to help you build the very best PC you can for your money.